On page Kuf Mem. It says, Hagaon Harav Moshe Feinstein. You'll find that it's the second paragraph on the page. If anyone needs an extra, I have one. Yeah. I love the way the Yeah, right? Fine. They always get the two years. Yeah, fine. You saw it. Hagaon, the genius, Harav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, in his book, Igrot Moshe. Gilat Moshe is one of the most fascinating halachic works I've read. I haven't read all of it, learned more correctly. It's an incredible collection of, of Rav Moshe Feinstein's mm-hmm. brilliance. People who read Rav Moshe will only then begin to understand how great he was. People take him very lightly, and he's not such a person to be taken lightly. Yeah. Rav Moshe Feinstein, heavy, he brings down a stirab magen Avraham, a contradiction in the writings of the Magen Avraham. The Magen Avraham is trying to codify when you have to wear a kippah and when you don't have to. The Magen Avraham writes, B'Saif Tzadi Aleph, in the 71st, I made it up, Tzadi is 91st, uh, chapter, Katav HaMagen Avraham, the Magen Avraham writes, She'af lelech arba amot, even to walk four amot, hurach midat chasidut. That's only that's only a an extra level of piety. Umnam Basif Bet, but in his second line, who katav he writes, Umidat Khasidu Tafilu Pachot Narba, that it's a level of piety even underneath four. I mean, see, what are you saying? More than four is an extra level of piety to cover your head? Or less than four is an extra level of piety? If you're saying more than four is an extra level of piety, what are you telling me? That the whole obligation of wearing kippah is, it is well, it also for amot only when you walk from it. Good, and also tell me, is it an obligation or is it is it uh, so optional? Uh, it's a midat chasidut. It's extra. It's optional. But if you're telling me that under for amot is a midat chasidut, so what do you tell me about after for amot? It's mandatory. It's mandatory. So what are you saying, Maganava? Are you saying this way or are you saying that way? Hamachatzita shekel, the book Machatzita shekel, which means the half shekel coin, the Hayad Ephraim and the Yad Ephraim, both are books. They gave some very not satisfactory answers to the question. Vaygot Moshe Katav and Rav Moshe Feinstein wrote the Taretz Bedech Acheret to give a different answer. He answers the following: Shekvar Nahagu Kol Yisrael. Remember, we began with Minhag yesterday with the Marshal. Oh, that already the entire Jewish people are have a Minhag. Um, I had I had an extra sheet. Your book is right there, by the way, and your extra sheets are right there. That because the Jewish people already have been accustomed, the filu apshutim, even the simple Jews, the chasot adrosham to cover their heads, yoter mi arba amot above four amot. Aval pachot mi arba amot, but less than four amot, humidat chasidut. This is only an extra level of piety. What's it here? It's only extra level of piety. Lichidim to for individuals with talmidei chachamim and for Torah scholars. V'yesh la'achmir and a person should be stringent, even less than four amot. So Moshe Feinstein seems to understand that the contradiction here is is one is halacha, his halachic opinion, that really beyond four amot it should be optional also. But because the Jewish people already have a custom that even the simple ones walk more than four amot with the kippah on, that's already become mandatory, and only less than four amot has become optional. Meaning this is a halakha that has changed due to the fact that the social norm of the Jewish people has changed. In other words, if you're going from one side of the room to the other, you're not obligated. If you go only if you're a Torah scholar or an individual who's scrupulous about these things. Right? But if you're going more than that, you must wear kippah. The reason why he writes V'yesh Lachmir, it's the proper to be strict. The Magen Avraham is a pretty big source for Ashkenazim. This is a big name. You don't, you don't take the Magen Avraham lightly. And when the Magen Avraham says something, that's pretty much what you do. So what's the Halakha? So we see so many opinions. So what, what's actually the Halakha? Now we're just stopping now. This is the second, third. 
We did the first third, which was bringing down the Gemarot and the Rishonim. The second third were the people who took the words of everyone before and analyzed them. We are now up to the third third, the final third, in which what we're doing is we're taking the words of the rabbis, the Acharonim, lehalacha, actual for halacha conclusions. We're now looking through different books to see not what they feel about the Talmud, but what they feel about the people who came before them, rather what is their actual opinion? What, what is their opinion? So we're going to see now. <laughs> Do you have a minute or you're going to go? No, I'm going to stay with you. Okay. Got the bottom. Lehalacha or lemase? I think there's a chair here that's open. Yeah, Shaul, you're welcome to sit here. Okay. How are we? Ten? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to say Kadisha then for yeah, for Shaul's father. Okay. So now, bottom line, halacha. Ha'otzot Yosef. Who wrote this book, Otzot Yosef? You know, you know? Rabbi? Uh, David. David Yosef, the one who's the author of the book we're reading. The halacha ulamase, ha'otzot Yosef, posek, he writes, Shemikar Adin, that the basic halacha is, Ein no ela midat chasidut, lechasot et rosho, bepachot mi arba amot. That under four amot, is a midat chasidut, is an extra level of piety to cover one's head. Who posek b'shitat marana shulchan aruch k'mo she perash nuna en? He writes above. He writes about like we said above that this is the opinion of maran the shulchan aruch. And in parentheses. That Maran himself actually felt this way. Not like what we're going to say later on in the, the Beru Halakha, which is a different book. We're going to see later on. The Kadav Gamken, he wrote also, to push off the opinion of the Taz. Shekotev Shazay Isur Min Hadin, that is actually forbidden according to Halakha. And it's forbidden because you cannot walk in the ways of the non-Jews. Do you remember that there was a Taz who said this, that it's actually forbidden? That the reason it's forbidden is so you don't look like a non-Jew? Rabbi David Yosef is pushing off this, this uh, opinion. Because you can't simply say that just because non-Jews do something, you're not allowed to do it. Rather, the only thing you're not allowed to do because non-Jews do it, are it's twofold. If the thing that they do, they do it out of pritzut, it's a, a, a promiscuous thing, it's something that leads to immorality, that's one. And the second thing, if it's a chok belita'am, if it's something they do without a reason, why, why are you not allowed to do something that non-Jews do without a reason? Because if you look for a reason, it probably won't be a good one. Right, because we assume that the reason is going to be rooted somewhere in paganism and avodah zarah, and it's something not good. But if you know the reason for why they do what it is they do, so then is it forbidden because that's the way the non-Jews do it? So long as the reason is not forbidden, so it would be allowed. I just saw something amazing. Um, do you know Mr. Rogers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mr. Rogers? Yeah. So yeah, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And I grew up watching these kind of shows yeah. back in the day. And my wife and I were talking, she didn't grow up watching any TV at all. So I was saying, you know, like, I agree that today... I don't think the TV shows are as educational as the TV shows were back then. I don't know. I don't watch TV today. But I told him, let's look it up. I remember this guy, Mr. Rogers. I put a Mr. Rogers on the computer, and I watched uh, uh, an episode of Mr. Rogers on how you make pretzels. How you make me took them to a pretzel factory. And it was fascinating. Assuming Mr. Rogers is a reliable source of information, the reason why they make pretzels with three spaces in it and a twist in the middle is to represent, it was a, something that the Catholic Church used to make for the children who came to pray. And it was to represent the Trinity. And the twist in the middle is the arms in prayer that are together, praying to the Trinity. And that's the tradition of why pretzels are made in, uh, with three holes and a twist in the middle. That's, that's, that's quite a twist. That's quite a twist. 
spoiled another one. That was according to Mr. Rogers. Now, I'm just waiting for the rabbi in, in Mash Hirem to watch Mr. Rogers and put up a big flyer saying you can only eat straight pretzels or round pretzels, but not the three hold pretzels, right? I'm gonna <laughs> oh, you're going you're gonna to get there one of these days. But until then, it's something interesting. So why they do something without a reason, sometimes you'll find that the reason is actually rooted in something very, very uh, foreign to us. Uh, and that's why we stay away from those things. This is so th- that's also the reason why some secular holidays can be differentiated from their religious roots and called all secular. Because, sure. Because, you know, like, I mean, Halloween is really religious, but something like... Uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving would be an example. Right. Even though it may have had originally kind of religious roots, um, that really... I mean, if you ask people today what Thanksgiving is about, who, who celebrate it, it's mainly about being thankful to God. So this is one of those things. This is one of those things that are, are have been up in flames in the Jewish community since I came to America. And it seems that Rav Soloveitchik said something similar to what you're saying, that there's a difference in a religious holiday and a national holiday, whereas other opinions were not so quick to make that differentiation for whatever reasons they had in mind. But simply saying that the, the video of Sef, is kind of making a rule. So you can't use the, oh, it's, it's a non-Jewish thing. You can, it's not a blanket statement. You can't use that for everything. <coughs> Maybe on a, on a midat chasidut level, you can say, I don't want to do something because it's not a Jewish thing to do. That's fine. But to prohibit it on a halachic ba- uh, basis of, that's a bichukutahem lo telechu, you're not allowed to walk in their, in their paths, you have to have a halachic formula which tells you what prohibits that. And this doesn't quite cut it. Not wear, wearing a bare head is not something they do out of any particular. It's just they don't wear a head covering. It doesn't mean that they. You also now have. It's not. It's not strong enough. So he pushes off the words of the Taz. Aval But if you take off your head covering for a reason, kagon machmat chom because it's hot, or ayefut or you're tired. Lo shayach bezechok. It can't be as a, a, a law, that a way of the non-Jews that you're not allowed to do. Because you're taking it off for a reason. You're taking it off because you're tired or it's hot. Like Maran himself writes in Yoreda, in the second volume of Shukhan Aruch, B'Shem Mahari Kolon, in the name of the Mahari Kolon, about the exact boundaries of what falls into the category of B'Chuk Tehem Lo Telechu. Hagra docheze. The Vilna Gaon doesn't like this idea. But I say here that you could push off what the Vilna Gaon is saying, like many other Achonim pushed off. As I quote here, the Ketab Sofer, that's the Ketab Sofer son, the Shut Maharam Shik, it's one of the Gdurim, the Chavet Dad, that's Rabbi Vadi Yosef, Yabi Omer is Rabbi Vadi Yosef. Ayan Sham, look in Rabbi Vadi Yosef's writings, Shehivi Kama Vekama. Mideot HaAchronim Be'inyan Zeh, who brings down an, a, very many opinions regarding this matter. Okay, so we have Rav David Yosef's opinion. Let's see the Bach's opinion. HaBach L'Maseh Sover, the Bach holds, Shara'u'i L'Hakpi, that a person should be careful, Bekisui HaRosh, to cover his head, even less than four amot. And he brings us down from the writings of Rabbeinu Yona. Rabbeinu Yona Av, anyone know where he's from? Yeah, 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 very nice. He was the one who burned the Rambam's books. And then did Tshuva, he wrote Shari Tshuva. In the book Sefer Hayra Shekotev, he should bend his back to lower his head because the Shekhinah is above his head. And therefore it's proper that a person should cover his head. He should not walk around bareheaded. So what do you see from Rabbi Yonah? That a person should, should cover their head. Because of Yerat Shemayim. You don't have to be a Torah scholar to cover your head. And he brings down from the words of the Rambam, in the laws of Deot, and in the Moren Vuchim, 
שלא יזכור כלל את הגדר של ארבע אמות. He does something fascinating with the Rambam. He says, remember the Rambam, where does he mention the laws of covering your head? By, by who? Only by... Tami Dei Chachamim. Remember that? And therefore everyone else is saying, see, the Rambam only holds the Torah scholars have to cover your head. He says, no, that's not what the Rambam is trying to tell you. He says, the Rambam doesn't even mention four Amot. What the Rambam is trying to tell you is you have to cover your head even less than four Amot. The Rambam understands that four Amot is a must, but less than four Amot is what you should do. He burned his books and commented on the Rambam? Sure. Then, uh, uh, is this is before or after? This is not Rabbein Yonah. This is the Bach. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. This is not Rabbein Yonah. This is the Bach. Because like many people do, they don't... They get... Um, the rabbis today that burn people's books. Um, they disagreed very much with the Rambam when he was alive. He was the most controversial guy in the block. He was like the... I don't want to give names, but... Whoever you think is controversial today and is really, really important. So the Rambam was that person back then. They did the same thing to the Ramchal. They burned his books. They did it to Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. They did that. You know, they did of Cook. They burned it out. Whoever, whoever the, they can find. Sure. They're pyromaniacs. That's what they like to do. But Rabbeinu Yonah did it because he really felt strongly that the Rambam's writings were opposed to Judaism. When he realized his mistake, he did Shuba. And that's why. In Germany, yeah. it was time, the first thing they did to burn all the books. All the books. Yeah. Right. There's a new movie out there. No, 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 it's not new. The book, uh, the, 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 the book, the book, the new one, about a girl who rescues books from the bonfire. Mm. We have a we have a precedent of burning books in, in halacha. If a non-Jew writes a sefer Torah, we don't read from it at the Torah. We can learn from it, but we leave it as it is. It's a holy book. If a heretic writes a sefer Torah, sefer shekadvon min says the Gemara, nisraf, we burn it. We burn it. What? It's probably not happening very much. It doesn't happen so much, but. If you want to mock Judaism, make a false. So, Haberu Halacha. There is a book called Beru Halacha, and believe it or not, it's not the same Beru Halacha you have in your Beru Halacha. It's in the Mishnah book. Oh, got it? So remember, you have a Halacha Bura, and on the bottom has a Beru Halacha. But this is not that Biru Halakha. There's a different Biru Halakha. Because there's a different Halakha Bura. Let's, let's get this all set and clear. There are two Halakha Buruas. One is a commentary on the Talmud, written by Rabbi Avraham Nitzchak Kakohen Kuk, <coughs> the first chief rabbi of Israel. And there's a Halakha Bura written about 70 years later by the son of Rabbi Vadi Yosef, Rabbi David Yosef, which is what we're studying. Rav Kook's Halakha Bura is a running commentary in the Talmud. Basically, when you're learning Gemara, you can just look over to the right side of the page and see, oh, the Rambam actually says this, and the Shulchan Aruch says that, and to see what the different opinions are. After Rav Kook passed away, a number of his students put together an institute called the Beru Halakha Institute. It's supposed to be a play on words of Halakha Bura. And what they do is, in the back of the Talmud, they put together lengthy essays uh, elaborating on what Rav Kook wrote. Why the Rambam? Why the Shulchan Aruch? Why this opinion? Why that opinion? And so that's its own book. And there's the Beru Halakha by Rabbi David Yosef. Two different books. So we're talking about the Beru Halakha, which is, as I write in parentheses, Besof Masechet Kiddushin. In the end of Masechet Kiddushin of the Halakha Bura, Rav Kook's Halakha Bura. Over there, in that book, Yotzeh Maskana, they come to the conclusion, Beshitat Maran HaShulchan Aruch, in the opinion of the Shulchan Aruch, not like Rabbi David Yosef. They say that the Shulchan Aruch means differently. Rabbi David Yosef says the Shulchan Aruch seems to be saying that it's only a midat chasidut to wear a kippah and not an obligation. But the Beru Halakha seems to disagree. And they write the following. They kotev and they write, Shemaran mevi din lashon shel isu. That Maran brings down this Halakha with the word of Asur, it's forbidden. 
And so his opinion is explained that in all places where you find that Torah scholars are praised for their head covering, what are, the, what are they really wearing? Why are we praising them? They have an extra head covering. The intention is to an extra head covering to the, uh, on top of the re- the normal head covering, shekol adam chayav bo, that every person must wear. So the Beru Halacha Institute believes the opposite of Rabbi David Yosef. And in their conclusion, I saw what surprised me, because when I read it, they said, Rabbi Yosef Cairo says you must wear a kippah. But I know that Rabbi Yosef Cairo doesn't say that. He says, lo yelech. But they understand that lo yelech, you should not walk, means you cannot walk. And they actually understand that Rabbi Yosef Cairo says it's forbidden. So now you have two opinions in the writings of Rabbi Yosef Cairo. How does that make you feel? Par for the course. Oh, okay, there you go. Do you have any flow charts? Yeah. I wish. Maybe we should pull one together. How does it go? I don't have a good word. Oh, so you can write it by hand, and then we'll... We can, use that. we can use Google uh, Draw with, like, the shapes. Yeah. Right, you can even do it in English. I don't know how to do this stuff, so if someone can do it... Yeah, I can why don't you sit down? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So do it for us, please. Do stuff all the time. Yeah. Now we come to a very interesting opinion. Kvod Ktushat, His Holiness, the Admor Hazaken, the Alter Rebbe, of Lubavitch. What does Admor stand for? Do you know? Like the sage of our generation. What? Admor means Rebbe, Hasidic Rebbe, but it doesn't really mean that. What does Admor stand for? Isn't there like an Adonenu, Moreno, Rabbeinu? Adonenu, Moreno, Verabeinu. That's what it stands for. It ends there, though. Wasn't like another thing? Like, <laughs> the older one, thank you, Zev, for getting it. The older one, meaning the Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitch Rebbe, he writes in his Shulchan Aruch. At the age of 17, the first Lubavitch Rebbe was asked by the Magad of Mezrich, his Rebbe, the student of the Baal Shem Tov, to write a Shulchan Aruch for Hasidim that would incorporate all the teachings of the Ashkenazi authorities as a codified Shulchan Aruch. So when we refer to it, we don't call it the Shulchan Aruch, we call it the Shulchan Aruch Harav, or in Hasidic circles, they call it the Alter Rebbe's Shulchan Aruch. But it's, it's not the same as Rebbe Yosef Cairo's Shulchan Aruch. It follows the same order, but it doesn't follow the same it's conclusions. The it's not the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, no. And it's not a complete Shulchan Aruch. They have it downstairs. Yeah, they have it downstairs. It's about four or five volumes. So the Alter Rebbe is the first? The first, the Bala Tanya. He wrote the Tanya, Rebbe Shneer Zalman of Liadi. Okay. He writes a hesber. He writes an explanation. Madua, why hechshivu do they consider et adam the person hamasirit kisui arosh who takes off his head covering keover al dat yehudit as a person who violates Jewish halachic norms? Now why why is it so bad to take off your kippah? He says and says al to Rebbe. Kevan because she bezman she Israel darim ben agoyim. That so long as the Jews live among the Goyim, the non-Jews, that their way is to walk without a head covering, walking that way is a, a, a complete prohibition, which is considered as walking in the ways of the non-Jews. Uh, but then we just disproved that before. Clearly he doesn't agree with the formula set forth by the Shulchan Aruch. Yeah, but when he says, like, you ship as much, like, they're among the going, so if they're not, like... Oh, so we'll get there. Ki alidei kisui harosh, because through our head covering, anachnu nikarim, we are recognized by Nehem, among them, sh'anachnu Yisrael, that we are Jews. It seems to be, the Lubavitch Rebbe says, there seems to be something about us needing to stick out as Jews. What about the cardinals who walk around the... With kippahs? Yeah, so I think you know how to tell the difference between the two of them. Hmm? I don't think <laughs> everyone ever confused a rabbi with a cardinal. 
the red Batman cape yeah. give them away. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, did we get to the Batman shine? Here? Oh, rare birds. birds, yeah, I got the rare birds. Rare birds. Is it, you know, I know you can't always go from one situation to another, but the situation where so if you live in a country of where, they, where the custom is not to do something that you don't have to do it. Not necessarily you have to differentiate yourself. Right. So I don't know that I dealt with that actually. Uh, one second, I'm gonna see. I did mention something about Yeah, yeah, I did I did bring I did bring down Rabbi Yosef Cairo's opinion about the difference in living amongst the Muslims and living amongst the Christians. I will, will do that soon. The Gemara of Sanhedrin. The Gemara of Sanhedrin says, guys, we're on our last page. Kol kavot to you. Masbira explains, you see where we are, the Kuf Mem Aleph, which is on the top of your page. Kuf Mem Aleph, you see that on the top left of your page? Kuf Mem Aleph. If you can't find it, ask. I'll, I'll find it for you. It should look like this. First letter is Okay. If the, the Talmud of Sanhedrin must be explains. Here. There it is. One more. Right up there. Right up there. Must be explains. She Israel, the Jews, Mithyachadim, are. Sp- Unique bishinui big dehem minagoim by differentiating ourselves and our clothing from the non-Jews. So, meaning, he understands that piece of Talmud that says that we look different than the non-Jews to actually be something we should do. We should look different than non-Jews, and part of that is by wearing a kippa, and that's how he understands. This is still the Alter Rebbe. I mean, being paraphrased though. Vod Katav Sham. He also writes there b'shulchan aruch harav in his shulchan aruch. Should be mehem that in their days, kisherov ha'am hayu regilim, that the majority of the people were accustomed to famim. Sometimes, the lechet begilui rosh mipnei hachom to wear no head covering because of the heat. Lo hayab adavar el midat chasidut. It was only prohibited from an optional standpoint. From the, it only was midat chasidut to cover your head. Imagine that we're not talking here about a kippah. Imagine a strimal. He seems to be shedding light that we didn't wear our strimals in the summer. We didn't have kippahs underneath them. And so people who didn't wear the strimal in the summer because of the heat. So that comes to show you that it's, it was only optional in their days. In the warm southern regions, you wear a hat to protect your head. From the sun. Very nice. It's a different kind of headgear. Yes. Yes. Aval, but bizman should derech hakol that everybody... Has a custom lakpid lechasot at rosham to cover their head. Laolam yesh isur ba davar mishum tsniut. We have an obligation from the aspect of tsniut. Kinechav ki megaleb saro hamchuse because it's considered as if you're revealing a part of your head or a body that is normally covered. He just opened up a can of worms. He basically gave you three prohibitions that you violate when you don't wear a kippah. The first or four actually. The first is because that's what everyone does. So you have to do it because it's dati hudit. It's become a Jewish societal norm. So if you somehow manage to get rid of that, he gave you a second reason, which is chukot hagoim. It's the way of the non-Jews to wear no head covering. And therefore, maybe you can get rid of that based on what we said before, but you still have the first one. Is it a chukot or they just never thought of it? They don't say, I don't cover my head. Oh, that's a good question. It's, it's like a good question. thing in society. You don't cover your except of course when you go to a Oh, group, so that's the next problem. You, you just you beat us to the second paragraph. Because you 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 already got somewhere ahead of us. But before good. we go any further, it's okay. Yeah. Um, it seems like we're spreading out into modern times more, moving ahead. And again, isn't it essential at this go know at the beginning what the source is and what Jews originally did in the world that they were in. Originally. Sure. Sure. And I think that that's why it's important to always look things into the source. Like we saw the source, the source was, wasn't so compelling 
that someone who doesn't wear a kippah is not Jewish, <laughs> or not following halacha. On the other hand, we weren't so convinced that it was blatantly obvious that you didn't have to cover your head. We're somewhere in the middle about that. And what we seem to be seeing now is that the farther the generations go, the more reasons they come up for why you have to continue wearing a kippah. That's what we do see right yes. now. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Then he gave us a third reason. The third reason is Tzniut. Tzniut. That the reason why people cover their head is because of modesty. I don't want, want anybody to I see my bald spot. It's too... Uh, no, but think, think about this. Halakhni, what is considered a private part of your body? Do you know? Anything that's normally covered. Very nice. You hear that? What is considered a private part of your body? A part that is normally covered. Could that change in different countries? Yes. Benish Chai talks about this. Oh, right, it's about women's head coverings, as well as what else he speaks about there? About people's feet. Ah, yes. The Benish mentions that in Europe, uh, uncovering your foot in public is actually considered very lewd and, and not snoot mm-hmm. and modest. And therefore, you shouldn't do that. You, if you see someone's foot, you're not allowed to pray in front of it. You can't because it's considered like a, a person's <laughs> erva, like an uncovered part of a person's body. Is but in, in Arab countries where that's what everyone does, he says. So then it's not the end of the world if someone takes out their socks in public or what you know, so on and so forth. Right now, I'm not convinced that in all on all Muslim countries they didn't wear some kind of sock on their shoes. They have to wash their feet. Okay, I don't know. I'm not. A... Okay, so then. Cannot just go pray to wash your feet, your hands, and your face. So it. I designed once every prayer five times a day. A mosque in Brooklyn. Yeah. The yeah. They have to, like, like, some area to wash the feet. Okay, so then, okay, okay, so then, fine. So then, you see that where the Ben Shai lived, it wasn't such a, it wasn't, it wasn't such a big deal to uncover your feet. Whereas in Europe, that was considered a big no-no. It could be that even in this country, most people wear wear shoes that are closed. Some people walk around the streets in flip flops and sandals, but not everyone. So not. Uh, you can you can then discuss here whether there is a norm. Is there a, a norm? So, be, so because the head covering was considered to be uh, mandatory, very nice. considered immodest. Because everyone already wears kippahs, when you take off your kippah, this part of your head is now considered not sniyot to show. Isn't that in the realm of Yitzhak? No. This is a, because the laws of sniyot are halachot that are based on societal norms. Now you could ask a different question. So then what if societal norms get way lax? So what happens then? Then you have interesting halakhic discussions with your local Orthodox <laughs> rabbi. Instead of asking them about the Holocaust all the time, ask them about <laughs> tzniyot and halakha. You'll scare them much more. But the Holocaust, they already have answers. Or they've come up with some. About, about tzniyot, this is a scary subject. Because you really can't pin a lot of things down in halakha. It's more on societal norms. But if societal norms have changed... Halakha gets very. Um... And you even have uniforms. I mean, you have like uh, you know, UPS and FedEx, and you know they're wearing uh, shorts and you know, short sleeves. And, uh, you right. Know, the question for we spoke like, about this well, before. Joe, it's like in the how, kitchen. Tens of thousands of workers. Are, According to halakha, you can't pray from uh, as the chazan if you're wearing shorts, because, because shorts is considered like a not new form of dress. Mm-hmm. So the question was brought up: What about on the kibbutzim? Yeah. Where everyone wore shorts, even the head of the kibbutz wore shorts. Even so, is that already considered an immodest way of dress? Or is that the way they're dressed? And there was a very interesting halachic debate that raged in that generation about what do you do? Does the person have to have special, special pants that they wear when they pray? Or something? There are crazy things that. What? Well, I can't hear you say. What What do the rabbis in the West Bank do? With the and everything? Different yeah, sure. I once had a letter from Rav Aviner saying that in his community, the girls don't wear stockings or socks because that's not the standard of dress. That if such a girl were to move to a neighborhood in Yerushalayim where they do, he said she would have to wear stockings halachically. That's what he wrote to her. Because she's now moving to a place where the societal norm is different. Now, I'm not always convinced that you can base a societal norm on, on, I don't think anywhere here is really such a closed society in which there's a norm already, that if you break it, yeah. I'm not convinced. And I'm not convinced that every Joe Schmo is the one who sets the standards. 
No, because when you say, what do the majority of Jews do? The majority of Jews don't keep Shabbat, so I'm going to stop keeping Shabbat now. <laughs> I'm like, so which Jews am I counting? Oh, Jews that keep Torah and Mitzvot. So then you're already saying something different. So the Jews already keep Torah and Mitzvot. You're talking about the standard of the Torah community. If so, then you have to define, so what is the Torah community? Who's part of the Torah community? Who's not part of the Torah community? And then you get into some very iffy details. But this is the Alter Rebbe's opinion, nonetheless. Basically, you have to wear a kippah, whatever way you choose. You can get rid of one reason, but you can't get rid of all three. Along comes a rabbi named the Khatam Sofer. The Khatam Sofer is one of the brilliant minds of Ashkenaz. He was Mechutanim, he was in-laws with Rav Akiva Eger. And he writes, V'chein Khatam Sofer, Khatam Sofer writes, Excuse me, I thought you said it was the fourth reason why. I thought I said it also. What I was getting mistaken was he said that in a place where people don't cover their head because of the heat, oh. then it's only a little... Meaning, it, I, I thought that was a separate thing, but it's really tied into Tzniut. Modesty, yeah, it's a modesty, societal so, modesty. Yeah. yeah. Only three, yes, thank you for correcting me. Only three. The Chen Kadama Chadam Sover similarly wrote the Chadam Sover. Listen to what he says. This is similar to what you were just bringing up now. Yesh Bahalicha Bigilu Harosh, that walking with a revealed head, Mipnei Chukota Goim, is forbidden because of the ways of the non Jews. I don't know if you noticed that the fight of separation amongst the non-Jews is coming from a very select region. Because that was a big problem in Europe. I'm not sure that in Sephardic communities, Jews had such a chance to assimilate into the culture that was around them. Whereas in Christian modern Europe, that was a big problem. A lot of people were leaving the community to become atheists, enlightenment, uh, whatever movements they were joining. And you see, therefore, that people are now on the defensive of, of you can't, we're trying to save ourselves from that community. You don't find that attitude so much in the Sephardic community. Not until recently, when the problem has reached the Sephardic communities as well. So who, who's the rabbi now? The Khatam Sofer. His name is Rabbi Sofer, but I don't know his first name. His son is Rabbi Benjamin Sofer. The Khatam Sofer's rabbi, maybe just a little bit of Jewish history, was a Rabbi Natan, or Rabbi Nasan Adler. Rabbi Natan Adler, if you put his name to Google, will fascinate you, because he was a Kabbalist who lived in the city of Frankfurt am Main and was persecuted for being a Kabbalist in Germany. Because he came at a very unopportune time for Kabbalists. Like right after Shabtai Tzvi. And uh, was chased around Europe and ended up in Frankfurt. That's where he stayed, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Through his study of Kabbalah, he reached the Idra Zuta, the Idra Rabba, the writings of the Zohar, which mention which letters are supposed to come from which part of your mouth when you pronounce Hebrew. Mm. And his conclusion was that Ashkenazi pronunciation of Hebrew did not match the Zohar's pronunciation of Hebrew. And he felt that he therefore had to go study pr- the Hebrew pronunciation somewhere else. And he looked around the world, and finally the t- community in Turkey agreed to send one of their rabbis to Germany for three years as a private tutor to Rabbi Nathan Adler wow. to teach him how to pronounce Hebrew in a Sephardic fashion and to pray with a Sephardic sitter. And Rabbi Natan Adler was perhaps the first Ashkenazi Jew in front of a German Jewish community to pray using a Sephardic accent with a Sephardic sitter. They didn't, they didn't kick him out? They didn't kick him out. Fast forward about 200 years, 300 years. Rabbi Vadi Yosef opens up the newspaper. How long did he live? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the Khatam Sofer was his student. This is him. Fast forward to about 50 years ago, in the early years of the State of Israel, a certain rabbi whose name I don't want to mention because he's a very holy person, put out an advertisement in a newspaper called the Hamodia. The Hamodia is officially a religious Jewish newspaper. It spouts a lot of Lashon Hara on a daily basis. And the Hamodia announced there a big letter, a full page, signed by a certain rabbi who was the Gadol Ador in that generation, saying that Sfaradim have to be forced to change their pronunciation of Hebrew. Because the way we pronounce Hashem's name is called Mecharefu Megadef Shem Shamayim. We disgrace God's name and we say His name in vain. 
The reason being that the only time you find in the Torah the word Adonai with a patach underneath the Nai is referring to a human being. And therefore Ashkenazim, when they say Adonai, they say Adonoi, right? right? Mm-hmm. Noi is only about Hashem, and Nai is about a man. It's a different pronunciation. I'm allowed to say Hashem's name because I'm telling you what it's supposed to sound like. Where do we use that? Like Moshe talking to Pharaoh? Or I don't remember where, right? where in the Torah it's fine. Like you can, the, I'll look it up for you. Maybe I'll be Mela. Yeah, so what he held was, even Svaradim, when they pronounce Hebrew, should say Noi at the end, not Nai. Because if they say Nai, they're saying that God is like a human being. So, God. Okay. And he uh, concluded that not only that, but the Sephardic Sifrei Torah were not kosher for Ashkenazim to get aliyot in. And that if you heard a Sephardi say Kiddush, you were not Yotzei, your obligation. Because he says Hashem's name wrong. It's not racist. He was, he was saying a halachic opinion. He wasn't, he wasn't out to fight the Sephardi. Nobody has to get up in arms over here. Yeah? I know we already feel, oh, wow, the Sephardic pride, I have to kill him. He's, he was, he's already dead, you know? And, and he wrote, this was his opinion, and he urged the Sephardic Yeshiva Bachurim to change their pronunciation of Hebrew. So, to this day, I remember dominating in Sephardic Minanim, where the Chazan says, Noi, because of this rabbi. He was a big person. If I told you his name, you would know who I'm talking about. Chacham Ovadi Yosef saw this paper, and he called up the Hamudia. He said, tomorrow morning you're going to run an ad, and it's not going to be a small ad in the back of the newspaper like you normally do to me, but it's going to be on the front page like everyone else, and it's going to be a full page, and it's going to say that anyone who changes their pronunciation like this rabbi wants to is dis- disgracing Hashem's name, violating his parents' heritage, and da-da-da-da-da. So he put that in the newspaper. <coughs> and then this rabbi calls up Rabbi Vali and says, how can you say it's just the name? He says, let me ask you a question. You hold of the Khatam Sofer? He says, yeah, he's from my family. This is well. Don't you know that his rabbi changed his pronunciation to Sephardic Hebrew? He said, and the phone was quiet. Mm. He says, so you don't have to say that that's what you need to do and that you agree. But to get up and make a proclamation that it's wrong, he says, you have a lot of chutzpah. You have a lot of chutzpah. And to the credit of this gadol, he took back his opinion regarding the Sifrei Torah, though he didn't take back his opinion to pronouncing, pro, pronouncing mm-hmm. Hashem's name. And uh, the war still rages. But mm-hmm. essentially, this was the Khatam Sovel. This was his rabbi. I always thought that Noi and, and Nai uh, were like Ashkenazic and Sephardic pronunciations. They had nothing to do with, you know, Na, Na. It's like that. Na, Noi is. Right, because Ashkenazic Ashkenaz pronounced Kamat as an O. Oh. Kamat O. Oh. Yeah. Right? We pronounce Kamat as an A. Ah. The problem is, A ah is like a Patah. A. Ah. So in, in grammar, it, come, it can make problems. Although you should know that the, the big question that Ashkenazim have on the Sephardim, and which is translated today into practical modern Hebrew, is, practical modern Hebrew, is how do you, how do you possibly pronounce two different vowels the same way? A kamatz and a patach, they look different. How can they pronounce the same way? So you actually have a song, a very ancient song. And the song is called... Tzur Mishelo Achanu Yeah, Tzur Mishelo Achanu Who wrote the song? Um, look, give us until we get it right Give us a multiple choice question No, no, not multiple choice There's a rabbi named Rabbi Elazar HaKalir Those of you who pray with an Arash Scroll Sitter will find in the High Holidays most of the songs come from him According to Ashkenazi tradition Rabbi Elazar Kalir, Kalir is a kind of cookie. Rabbi Elazar Kalir is none other than Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, obviously, the academic historic community doesn't like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai so much in general, and uh, it could be that they have a different opinion as to who Rabbi Elazar Kalir is. It could be, which is why I'm not bringing this as a diehard source, but rather as an idea. According to Ashkenazi tradition, this is where the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So, sing the song with me for a second. No, sing just the words. Tzur mi shelo achanu, barechu emunai, nai with a patach. Savanu vehotarnu kidvar ado, with a kamatz. To which the Sephardic poskim point and say, clearly this whole song rhymes. If you go through all the verses of the song, they rhyme. 
and the rhyme of kamatz with a patach must be because they were pronounced the same way. This is one of their... Sephardic. What? Sephardic. Because, well, the Zohar is the one who says this yeah. is kind of... Yeah. So that's, that's how it goes together. Yeah. It's interesting. Listen. Elu ve'elu di'velu b'chayim. Both are right, so we'll figure it out one day who's right. Yeah. So, the Chadam Sover says something fascinating, like what Zev was trying to bring up. Yesh b'halacha b'gilui ha'rosh... Yeah, sorry. Yesh b'halacha b'gilui ha'rosh walking like the non-Jews bareheaded it is forbidden out of the Pnei Chukot goyim because you're not allowed to walk like a non-Jew. Omnam ayin sham, but look there. Shekatav tam k'tzat shoneh, but he brings a different reason, a different, slightly different reason for why this is true. Kivan sheha goyim, because the non-Jews nahagu lehasir et kova'am have a custom to take off their head covering Miyad immediately in Knisatam when they walk into Leveti Ratam to their house of worship. <coughs> what is he doing here right now, Zev? He's comparing it to the religious custom. He's giving a reason religiously now why they take off their head covering. It's part of their religion that when they enter a house of worship they take off their head covering. Ooh. The non Jews, the Christians. <laughs> Take off their, head, their hats. When they come into a building. In a oh, private, exactly. like a yeah. court building or, yeah. or gonna, inside. I, I used to be a grave digger, and when, uh, when the hearses would come in, I mean, I was going to drop 10 years. <laughs> you, had to, you had to take off your work cap. I wasn't going to say that. Sign of a sign of respect. Yeah. But this whole concept of removing your head covering as a sign of respect <laughs> is a non Jewish custom. Right? Oh, we have the different custom that to cover your head is a sign of respect. Right. And therefore, what the Khatam Sofer is doing is something interesting. He's latching on bareheadedness, not out of convenience, they just do it because they don't want to cover their head, but they uncover their head out of some reason that we're not allowed to follow. <laughs> huh? You see what he's doing here? Yes. Okay. If you want to really split hairs, though, it's only for uh, very specific things. It isn't. We keep our heads uncovered all the time because it's a religious reason. It's only if they happen to be wearing a hat and they go somewhere. But if they weren't wearing a hat, it wouldn't make a difference. Right? Right. But also, I think we're underestimating the fact, or we're not appreciating the fact that everyone wore a head covering. Until, even until the, the early, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s of this country, everyone wore hats. One of the Chicago gangsters, Right? No, who was the first? The first president who took off his hat was Kennedy, could be? Yeah. The first one who removed his hat. And that was a, that was a world uproar. Really? Yeah. The first American president who removed his hat. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking, I mean, I've, I saw other presidents earlier. Yeah, I mean, Ike was seen. Yeah, you saw Ike without. Or maybe old was on the official. Of, uh, official yeah. For example, today you have seen the president in a polo shirt. That was something that maybe thirty years ago you would never see a president in. A president in a polo shirt. Also, there's nothing wrong with a polo shirt, but meaning the standards are are changing. In shorts, We're playing that, golf, yeah, right? Saw, you know, we saw Clinton in his in his short shorts. That was like a, that was. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't do that on purpose. All photos are never official the once they go. Isn't that what? Never in the White House they will wear shorts and polo shirts like on Camp David on retreats, and never on business. Well, I mean the president. The, there still is a certain standard of dress. The official dress would be a suit and a tie and a shirt, right? Today, you know, the, the current president has already taken that standard. If you've seen pictures, I, how do I know? Because the, there's a very conservative community that very much cares about the way the image of a president is. I don't care much for it, but it happens to be that in yeshivas, they like to, to use this a lot to manipulate people in forms of dress. And essentially, his new form is a button-down shirt with his jacket over the shoulder. That's something that he introduced to the White House. You never saw a president before do something like this. That was much more casual than what was used to before. Uh, you know, for example, uh, maybe it's again a little bit complicated, but there are certain halachot we learn from what royalty in a certain country eats and doesn't eat. Mm-hmm. There's certain halachot that come up. Royalty would mean whichever is the highest class of government in a country. It doesn't have to be a king necessarily. It could be an elected president or, uh, or anybody who it is. And therefore it used to be that certain cashier companies would call up the White House uh, kitchen, and ask them, would you serve X in the White House kitchen, or Y in the White House kitchen, and that would have ramifications in halacha. And they've noticed that as the years go on, 
more and more things that never would be served in the White House kitchen are now served in the White House kitchen. White House kitchen. If you look at the people, the people are different type of people. What do you mean? And all are the uh, same color. <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm recorded here. So, uh, essentially, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. It comes, to, it comes to canned items. In a very high-class restaurant, they won't serve you canned goods. Canned it's not... Peaches. That's a really like... Canned peaches. Right, peaches. it's not the kind of thing that they're not... They'll bring fresh green beans, not canned green beans. And therefore, there are different halakhot regarding canned green beans. What am I telling you? That in his place, everybody wore a head covering. So it's not like what we're saying today that people don't, everyone wore a head covering. And the only time they removed it was out of honor to their avodah zahar, to somebody else. And that's the, we Jews, we never take off our head covering. Because we have to show that we're always, according to the Khatam Sofer. It's, it's like an in spite kind of thing. And therefore he says, We have differentiated ourselves from their custom, from their minhag. You ever do something that the non Jews have minhagim also? <laughs> And we accepted upon ourselves the minhag of covering our head. Mishum lo telechu. That in the ways of the non-Jews we shall not walk. I write here, Vayen od b'shut Yaskil Avdi. There's a Sephardic book. Uh, the Yaskil Avdi who brings a similar idea. Last but not least, let's finish this sentence. Bigrot Moshe Hiksha. Rav Moshe finds him then asks here, Lama marana shulchan aruch zal lo asam b'nechog akum. Why did Maran and the Shulchan Aruch not say it's forbidden because this is the way of the non-Jews? Now here's something very interesting. Rabbi David Yosef already answered this question two pages ago. He said the reason why Maran didn't say it is because Maran gave a formula for how you decide if something is something the non-Jews do. If it doesn't have a reason. But if it has a reason, it wouldn't be prohibited. But Rav Moshe finds that clearly there's a different opinion amongst the Ashkenazim of how you decide what is considered Bechukteim Lo Telechu. Which is why Rav Moshe finds in this force to come up with a different answer. And listen to his answer. Hu mitaretz, he answers that the reason why Maran doesn't say you should not uncover your head like the non-Jews. Tell me why. He lived in Komot Aravim, in place where there were Arabs. Which never took off their head covering either. And therefore, Maran couldn't tell you, don't take off your head covering because that's what the non Jews do, because the non Jews always wear a head covering. The non Jews always wore a head covering. In, 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 the, in the Arab culture, you should, there are a lot of things. It's unfortunate that for political reasons and other reasons, these two communities are very far apart. But, but in, a, in a culture fashion, even in a religious fashion, there's a lot more in common that we have. With with that than we do with the Christian world. Yeah. If you look at Morocco, sure. Uh, but the, the reason being that it was uh, there were a lot there was a lot in common. Yeah. You know, listen, even now when I go shopping at, at North Park Produce, I always find like, and I don't buy jarred filter fish at North Park Produce. Like I'm buying the same stuff everywhere else is. I'm always looking at those Sadaf spices and I'm picking out nana leaves from the bunch and I'm buying the you know whatever whatever it is that it is. we. I don't, I don't know what to do with this information, aside from the fact that Maran made his decision. He didn't forbid it based on the custom of the non-Jews, because where Maran lived, there was no such thing. Where Maran lived, the non-Jews also covered their head, so that couldn't have been enough of a reason for Maran to tell you, you must always cover your head. Whereas he says in Ashkenaz, he would... What do I buy there? Everything on this table came from North Park Purdue. So... Uh, let's let's say that next Monday, God willing, we will finish this. Yeah. We'll come to a final conclusion.